You're watching FJTN, the Federal Judicial Television Network. Coming up on Court to Court. What I'm going to present to you today are 10 challenges that my feeling is that if they're not addressed within the next eight or so years, uh, we're going to be in extremely serious trouble as a court system. I jumped at the chance to be able to mentor somebody and have a backup in my position. The program has inspired me, motivated and supported me to step outside of my comfort zone. This is Court to Court, your connection to what's happening in the federal courts around the country, providing information and ideas that will enhance your job and how the courts function. Now with today's program, Michael Burney. Welcome to Court to Court, the Federal Judicial Center's educational magazine program for all court employees. Today's show features a training technique that's a big plus for both employees and the court, some insights into implementing electronic case filing, and a couple of Latin phrases that made the news last year. But we begin with what some people think is in the future of the courts. Moving into this new century has accentuated our sense not only of change, but also the need to manage it effectively. For the federal courts, where an underlying premise is devotion to precedent, change can be challenging. The Federal Judicial Center provides opportunities for court personnel to learn how to cope with and manage change. At a recent FJC conference of district court clerks, executives, and chief deputies, the theme was leading the courts in the 21st century. Some of the thought-provoking exchanges show that there are many different perspectives on the changes facing us. What I'm going to present to you today are 10 challenges that my feeling is that if they're not addressed within the next eight or so years, uh, we're going to be in extremely serious trouble as a court system. Martin's top 10 list includes fostering court services that respect cultural diversity, dealing with the shortage of qualified court staff at all levels, responding to the emerging revolution in how private legal services are provided, that is, the bundling of legal, accounting, financial, and management services. Next on his list, Implementing Meaningful Performance Assessment, Dealing with the Dangers of Mission Creep, Then the Need for Coordination Between the Justice System and the Field of Human Services. This is followed by narrowing what's perceived as a growing gap between the courts and the public, Implementing More Effective Court Governance, Harnessing the Second Information Technology Revolution, and developing effective knowledge transfer mechanisms between knowledge discoverers and knowledge consumers. Using the FJC's audience response system, Martin asked the participants to vote for which challenge they thought is most important. With this voting technology, there's no chad, hanging, dimpled, or otherwise. Let's see what the results are. Why do you think we got this pattern? I mean, does this pattern surprise any of you? Shortage of qualified staff and improving court governance tied with 14% of the audience saying they were most important. Martin asked the audience for comment about governance. So he makes a key point. He said that unless you get a handle on this issue, you're not going to be able to really handle the other issues, right? Also, the first choice of another 14% of the participants was dealing with a growing shortage of qualified staff at all levels. Martin said that one aspect in this challenge is a growing disparity in compensation between the private sector and the courts. It's a little tough to offer stock options, isn't it, as a federal court? We'll give you some more gun cases. You can take all the gun cases home you want. How about drugs? We'll give you all the drug cases you want. Martin said that one way to attract employees is to emphasize a positive work environment. How about the way you prepare future staff? How about the ways you prepare um, people who are going to replace you? How do you do that now? One of the participants, Stefan Harris, has some thoughts about staff development. I think the best support for, for me and my court, especially me being a new chief deputy, would be collaboration, uh, team effort, uh, also networking, and also mentoring. What happens if you don't address this issue in the next decade? 
The participants answered that the courts would lose their best and brightest people. But Martin said there's more. What I'm going to suggest is that you're going to lose a lot of continuity. The fact is that many of you are going to be retiring at about this within a five-year uh, time frame all at the same time. The, the amount of expertise that leaves the system at one time will be fairly dramatic. And that has some pretty big consequences. Almost one-fourth of the participants voted harnessing technology as the biggest challenge. It's the ability to uh, identify and, and manage and cope with the technologies that are coming down the pike, but to do so in a way that provides and identifies what it is that the public and the u end users of our services uh, re will really need. Martin asked the participants what they really needed to know about technology since they couldn't know everything. So it's really the question of how do you communicate with um, people who have more expertise than you do. You don't need to know the megahertz, the bits, bytes, the bop, ba, boop. What you really need to know is figure out what it is you're trying to do and how you can do it. Chief Deputy Clerk Terry Deppner summed up how she views these top four challenges. The biggest challenge will be the compilation of all those four challenges because we have to deliver justice as the product or the service that people want. And we also have to uh, do it wisely and use technology to do that. And you have to use your staff. Following Martin's presentation, District Court Judge Royce C. Lamberth gave a judicial perspective on the future of the federal courts. We have to work together as a team, but we have to have early and frequent and constant input from the field offices, from your offices, from all of you. Because if we don't solve this problem, we won't solve any of the other problems that we're talking about here today. Judge Lambert agreed that harnessing technology is the judiciary's highest priority. He added that judges and staff will become more familiar with what he called the criminal side of computers. Some law enforcement officers estimate that cybercrime is growing at a rate that may soon rival the volume of immigration and drug cases flooding the southwest border states. In this instance, the caseload will be divided among all courts across the country. The increase in cybercrime will not only increase our caseloads, but it will place new demands on judges, as well as probation and pretrial personnel who will have to learn new methods of carrying out their duties in virtual reality. Judge Lambert also asked participants to vote on several questions. Let me turn to the last question, and that is one near and dear to my heart. When will the first major breach of the DCN occur? And I'll ask you to vote in 10 seconds on that one as well. Gosh, 61% are right again. It already has, but, you know, we really don't know about it. In fact, we don't know to what extent it's happened. If you get one thing out of this conference about technology problems, you get the notion that you really ought to be talking to your computer people about what kinds of security issues you can take some steps to deal with before we deal with the national level problems. I think we have to uh, leave the conference, uh, go back to our respective courts, uh, discuss what we've learned today with our bench and our court staff and say, hey, uh, we've got a lot of work to do and I think we need to start today to get some of that work accomplished. As we heard in that story, finding and keeping qualified staff at all levels may be one of the biggest challenges in the future. In our next story, we'll see how the District Court for the Northern District of New York uses mentoring and cross-training to benefit both staff and the work of the court. Clerk of the District Court, Larry Behrman, developed mentoring and cross-training as part of a performance management system. He had several goals, training new employees, providing the best possible training to all staff, and dealing with the geography of the district. There are four staffed offices, some of them almost 150 miles apart. Two of the offices have 10 or fewer staff members. It's important in all of our offices, because of my size, to have people cross-trained to do multiple functions. Should I docket the memorandum and affidavit and supporting papers before I take the order to show cause to the judge? I think it makes much more efficient operation. Uh, and I think the employees enjoy the ability to be able to move into other areas more easily. 
Behrman also wants training to be consistent in offices throughout the district. And there's another goal. It needed to be developed from the people that do the jobs day in and day out. Those people are most familiar with what's done today and what's needed to accomplish that job. And so I think involving them in that process and giving them the ability to say what needs to be done and how it should be done uh, is really what made it work. Behrman asked for volunteers from each of four operations groups to create mission statements and training curricula. We talked about every little thing we could think of that um, every situation, every problem, um, every aspect of dealing with the jury. Tara Burt works in the Albany Division. She was on the committee that wrote the mission statement and designed the curriculum for jury administration. There are issues that I deal with in Albany that aren't dealt with in other offices and, and the other way around as well. Um, so we basically came up with a flowing checklist from start to finish and it included everything that you'd ever need to know about jury. Judy Ball was first trained as a docket clerk. The checklist starts out with the basics and then goes into more depth. You know that you've covered everything at the beginning because you're marking down that you did um, each step. Every job function is covered. And the mentor can make notes in the comments section of the checklists. They're designed so that a manager can sit down with the mentor and, and even with the employee being mentored and take a look very quickly and see how far have we progressed. The checklists work whether cross-training an experienced employee or mentoring a new employee. I think the biggest challenge for me is because I've been a doc clerk for six years is to remember what it's like to be brand new, to start from the very beginning. There's a lot of things for me I want, I, I can like pass over because they're so, you know, commonplace for me now. But when I started, of course, they weren't. So it's important that you convey everything from the start as if you were new as well. The vision that they have for the job that they do changes because now they're responsible to teach another employee. Jackie Tritak also mentored to Judy Baugh as a courtroom deputy. It's probably increased morale because we're actually being given this responsibility and we feel I think trusted. And the first thing that happens is the judge informs the defendant, the defendant's going to be over here, the prosecution's going to be over here. The judge will inform the defendant of all the rights that he's giving up by pleading guilty. It also helps me to do a better job because I know someone's watching me and I want her to learn to do things the right way. You have to know what count of the indictment he's pleading guilty to and you're going to go to the indictment and you're going to read. You'll know you're done when you see all in violation of Title 21, United States Code, Section 846. And then you're going to ask them, how do you plead to this count? It's easier when you're sitting down with someone and they're going over things one-on-one -on -one with you instead of just, you know, you getting the papers and, and trying to uh, learn by a book. The goal of it in the end is that they will eventually be so well-versed in all of the things that they've learned in the job that they're preparing for that they would then be able to teach the person who just trained them so efficiently and so well that it's like they now are already in the job. We're going to cover a motion for summary judgment. Um, when these papers come in, they're actually taken in through the intake section. They actually go through all the paperwork to make sure that they comply with our rules and regulations. I think that they take, they take a lot more pride in, in knowing that they're a more valuable asset to the court. Uh, I also think that they are more confident in handling everything that happens in the office. You're going to need to have this Northern District Uniform Pre-Sentence pre Order completed with the sentencing date set 120 days into the future. You're going to have this ready for the judge to sign. It makes me do a better job and it, it's kind of a review for me because, you know, we don't do certain proceedings every day. But when you're mentoring someone, you're not really allowed to forget. You, you know, you're reminded all the time, so you're kind of retraining yourself. When she first started in the clerk's office, Sunday we met was trained by a docket clerk doing the same job she was to do. I enjoy being trained by another staff member and knowing that they do it on a daily basis, I was very comfortable with that. I think the big plus in the training is knowing that you have another individual there that can answer any questions for you. Now how do I know what the motion date is? Okay, what you want to do is you want to verify that his case schedule, um, what the current motion dates are, 
that the motion complies with the timely deadline of that date. I jumped at the chance to be able to mentor somebody and have a backup in my position uh, because at the time I was the only person in my divisional office that handled the jury um, and it was a lot of pressure and a lot of stress because I do have other duties other than the, other than as a jury clerk. John Law is an intake clerk whom Bert trained to be another jury clerk. When the training began, he felt overwhelmed, but now... The biggest payoff has been advancing my knowledge in the federal courts. This part of the jury request form uh, will indicate how many jurors you need to call in. Um, sometimes extra jurors are needed. But how many additional jurors are we going to need to, re to call in to make it efficient so that we don't affect our utilization too much? Well, for that information, you would need to be in contact with the courtroom deputy, um, find out if extra challenges are given. Now being trained on it, that is becoming more like common knowledge to me, and it's becoming easy. And now that I can handle it on my own when I go home, it, it just feels really fulfilling to, my, to myself. The next step in the district's mentoring and cross-training program consolidates training resources in one database. All staff throughout the district can access material on their own. Consolidate Chief Deputy the, Clerk John Domrad explains one place. example. What we've done here is we've set up a docket sheet for a Federal Debt Collection Act action. And it can be a tricky docketing entry. Pertinent issues are put forth and highlighted in green text. And then underneath those green text, you'll see a link to a red text, which is a reminder or a key note that you should be aware of when you're actually doing the docket entry. And the next page, again, you're going to see the actual text of the docket sheet. And underneath the text, you're going to see some red text, which will, will walk you through what we have out there. For example, here's where you're going to find a copy of an actual application order for writ of garnishment. And that'll be found under the scroll icon. And that's going to take you to the hyperlink to an actual application. Another feature uses software called ScreenCam. With it, staff can follow along as automated clips of docket entries are revealed. This is walking them through a docket clerk through the actual procedure. There's also a series of links to other resources, such as the intake manual, local rules, even the relevant statutes themselves. On the left hand side, for example, the clerk's manual. It's very easy to consolidate all the resources into one and make sure that they're updated uniformly throughout the district. And then he'll ask you... The mentoring and cross-training program has proven to be a big success for the Northern District of New York's district court. I, I, I just can't say enough about how powerful I think the program is, either to train a new person or to cross-train an existing employee. And I got to tell you, I think that the, that the performance end of it has just gone through the roof because of this. The Honorable Mormon A. Mordew presiding. Please come forward and be seated. Latin is officially a dead language, but many of its words and phrases are alive and well in the law and in court proceedings. Court-to-court -court viewers have asked us to define some of these terms, and so here, with words to know, is my colleague, Bob Fagan. One viewer asked, what is certiorari? Today we hear this word almost exclusively in regard to the United States Supreme Court. A few months ago, certiorari was in the news a lot when the Supreme Court was twice confronted with challenges to the presidential election in Florida. In Latin, certiorari means to be informed of or to be more fully informed. Most cases that come to the Supreme Court come by way of a writ of certiorari, and a writ is a judicial order. A writ of certiorari is an order from an appellate court to a lower court directing the lower court to produce a certified record of a particular case decided in that court. The court issuing the writ wants to review the proceedings in the lower courts to determine if there were legal errors. Litigants disappointed with the decision in their case made by a federal court of appeals or state supreme court may file petitions for certiorari or cert petitions with the supreme court asking it to review that decision. A cert petition includes a list of the parties, a statement of the facts of the case, the legal questions presented for review, and arguments as to why the court should grant the petition and issue the writ. For example, last December, one of the presidential candidates, as the Supreme Court put it, filed a petition for certiorari to review the Florida Supreme Court decision. The court went on to say 
we granted certiorari on two of the questions presented by the petitioner. The court receives about 7,000 cert petitions a year, but Rule 10 of the Supreme Court states, review on writ of certiorari is not a matter of right, but of judicial discretion. A petition for writ of certiorari will be granted only for compelling reasons. The court has been granting fewer than 100 petitions for certiorari in recent terms. For the other petitions, it's cert denied. That means the court refuses to review the case and the judgment of the lower court stands unchanged. If the court grants the writ of certiorari, that doesn't necessarily mean that it disagrees with the decision of the other court. A cert granted only means that the Supreme Court wants to review the case. One factor the justices often consider is whether a decision of a federal appellate court appears to be in conflict with the decision of another federal appellate court. Another factor is whether a state or federal court has decided an important federal question which should be decided by the Supreme Court. The court rarely grants cert petitions when a petitioner claims that the lower court simply made, in the words of Rule 10, erroneous factual findings or simply misapplied a properly stated rule. In other words, the Supreme Court uses certiorari not to correct errors in individual cases, but to clarify the law or resolve disagreements among other courts. Our other word today is sua sponte, which isn't an Italian sparkling wine, but rather is a Latin phrase meaning of one's own will or motion. Other interpretations are without prompting or suggestion or of one's own accord. In the judiciary, the phrase refers to an action taken on the court's own initiative. Sua sponte is most commonly used to describe a judge's decision made without a request by any party to a case. This can include an order transferring the case to another judge due to a conflict of interest or the judge's determination that the court does not have jurisdiction over the case. For example, you might hear someone say that sua sponte, the court extended the deadline for filing motions. Another example from the election dispute last December, the U.S. Supreme Court wrote that the Florida Supreme Court accepted jurisdiction and sua sponte entered an order enjoining, meaning prohibiting, the secretary in the Elections Canvassing Commission from finally certifying the results of the election. Latin remains alive and well in the courts. When you hear these terms, we encourage you to check their meanings on your own. A regular dictionary has some of the more common Latin phrases, but you're better off going to a law dictionary. There are several, but Black's Law Dictionary is probably the best known. In fact, why not look up per curiam? That's the kind of U.S. Supreme Court opinion that I quoted from earlier. That's words to know for today. Oh, I mean, illudest verba cognoscere per hoc tempus. Te vide bautunc ad curia ad curiam. As we've seen in our program today, staff issues loom large in the court's future. One way the FJC helps develop tomorrow's leaders is the federal court leadership program. Each participant chooses a problem to solve or task to complete, which will benefit his or her court unit. The exercise keeps the focus on the needs of the court. For one project, four participants from different bankruptcy courts chose to work together to study case management, electronic case filing implementation. The reason I chose the team approach for the federal court leadership program is that as systems professionals, we tend to huddle amongst ourselves and only talk to technical people with a scope of the project that we're going to be implementing. There are going to be so many people from different backgrounds in the courts and drawing on different experiences that we will need. We just can't imagine doing without it. We made it work, being as we're in, in different locations and in different states, by using email, voicemail, and in some instances we had video conferencing. Um, so that helped pull it all together. Their project taught them the importance of a team approach to implementing CMECF. Finance, budget, training, uh, quality control issues, HR issues, how people's jobs will change. So you need the expertise of each, of someone in each of those areas to help facilitate a plan and have it all go off as smoothly as possible. The challenge of getting such a diverse group of people together to implement something of the scope of CMECF would be to always keep lines of communication open and draw from the experiences of other people. Another benefit was learning to involve attorneys. 
The key to getting them to buy in would be to basically share with them the cost benefits. And by sharing with them how it would benefit not only their staff, but the people that rely upon them to represent them in the court environment. Donald Wall from the Seventh Circuit's Court of Appeals tackled a problem of too few attorneys to handle criminal appellate cases. I have set up a program with the uh, Seventh Circuit Bar Association to establish a mentor program with attorneys who are inexperienced in federal criminal appellate practice to help to, to, to pair them up, team them up with uh, an experienced federal criminal appellate practitioner uh, to learn how to do these cases. The FJC's two and a half year leadership program concludes with a ceremony at the center. Several participants described what the federal court leadership program meant to them. The program has inspired me, motivated and supported me to step outside of my comfort zone and volunteer to manage for the district one of the most important initiatives that the clerk's office will address over the next few years. But all of this started from someone who, who took a look at me and said, Eva, I know you can do something, and I, and I know that you want to do something more than what you're doing. Another participant who studied strategies to implement CMECF was Michael O'Brien. During most of the program, he was in the Northern District of Texas, but he has since accepted a position in California. I, I gained a lot of, of knowledge, and I took that knowledge, and uh, hopefully in the report that I prepared, uh, the Northern District of Texas will be able to use that information to help them prepare for this big change. And I still have that knowledge with me and you know, hopefully I can use that in my new position. Each participant finds unique benefits from the Federal Court Leadership Program. Having the discipline to do the research that was necessary both for the program and for the CMECF project in, in my court and I got a lot of information that I've been able to share. And giving you more confidence as a leader and helping you put the pieces together as a leader. The real benefit would be to encourage yourself to move onward and upward. The FJC will begin accepting applications in September for the next federal court leadership program. The program's underlying premise is leading from where you are. Summaries of other projects from the program can be found on the FJC's DCM intranet site under multi-phase training programs. We know that many of you are working on projects that will benefit your court unit now and in the future. We'd like to hear from you about them or any topic. You can contact us at the address on the screen. Click on Court to Court, select Online Evaluation, print the form, and then fill it out. You can also tell us topics you'd like to see on future programs. Mail or fax the evaluation to us. Our fax number is 202-502. 4088. That's our program for today. Be sure to tune in for the next edition of Perspectives on Probation and Pretrial Services, which will feature some innovative programs developed by officers that benefit their local communities. On our next programs, we'll visit two courts that volunteered to be alpha courts for the transition to case management electronic case filing. And we'll learn some techniques to enhance communication between systems and operations folks. On behalf of everyone here at the Federal Judicial Center, thank you for watching today. I'm Michael Burney.